himself and the defender asked him to insert his sermon testimony, which I think we should do many. Yeah. Uh, somebody wants to listen yeah. to it uh, without all the tuning in the whole service. We can do that. I bet that. I mean, the people tell me I'm going to continue for the sermon. Yeah, I'm yeah, 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 Yep. Choose your age. It's a matter of what's going to get. It's all like it. uh, I need the exercise. What about the modern residential chair? Yeah. It's the right. I think it's more of a barber chair. Oh, it's a barber chair. I'm hey, I'm using. And Again, you know, my thanks uh, to the Rosenberg family, Zebron, School, Zebron, actually, Zebron, I'm Zebron. We're both um, Alfred and Vic. This is just a great way to spend the weekend. It's a great way to honor the congregation for their notes. Thank you. So I know you know that this has been an extraordinarily difficult time to be a human being. And I think uniquely difficult time to be a Jew. 
politics in this country has become highly partisan. And where there used to be some space for the ability to exchange conflicting views and to try to learn from other people, that's pretty much gone. We've seen the terrorist attack on Israel. And then we're horrified not only by the attack, but by the various ways people responded or didn't respond to the attack. I think you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be deaf to Israel's need to defend itself to also be horrified by the civilian deaths in Gaza and the terrible destruction there and the way that population is also enslaved by Hamas and terrorized in their own ways. The resurgence of anti-Semitism in ways that continue to shock and to horrify. The way that people's disagreement with some Israeli policies quickly slides into anti-Zionism, which then slides into overt anti-Semitism making it very hard to have what could be a reasonable disagreement because of the way it slides. I walked to your synagogue this morning and was greeted by your welcome committee out on the street. And some of the signs were merely offensive. Some were moronic, but some were threatening of a level of violence against innocent Jews, and I was trying to imagine if Scotland or England had a policy someone didn't like, would anyone be threatening death outside of an Anglican or an Episcopalian church? How absurd that sounds. And, and a widespread sense of isolation so that Americans of all ages report record levels of depression, and anxiety and loneliness in ways that we've never encountered before. All of this comes together and I think hits our community because if you're like me, there's even a term for what I know I shouldn't do, but I do. It's called doom scrolling. And doom scrolling is you get on some social media and the media has watched how I like to feel terrible. And so... It chooses anti-Semites from places I've never heard of, and I find myself being irate and feeling attacked by someone I've never heard of from a place I've never heard of before. And that happens all day long, every day. So I want us to take a step back tonight. I don't want to talk about the headlines. I'm not going to analyze the war or what Israel's policy ought to be, or whether Biden is right or wrong in whatever this or that. I'm not a statesman and I'm not a military strategist. What I am is a rabbi. And so I want us to give ourselves a night to remember what it is that connects us to Israel deeper than headlines. And let me tell you what I think that's like. There are many things that the United States has done in its history, indeed many things it's still doing, that fill me with anger and shame. And at the same time, I am a patriotic American. I love this country. And my love of this country is strong enough to recognize that it has areas that it needs to work on, some quite seriously. But those Areas of shortcoming don't stop me from connecting to the deep love that I have for this country and its best traditions. So I want to look at Israel from that vantage point. Whatever disagreements you may or may not have with this government or the preceding government or this policy or that group of Israelis you don't like, whatever, you have every right to have all of those feelings because it's a democracy, and you're alive, and you're Jewish. 
but it's not what I want to focus on tonight. Tonight, I want us to go deep, and I want us to talk about what beyond politics is of abiding value that continues to connect us to Israel. Okay? All right. So for me, there are four groupings for what binds me to Israel that I want to put out on the table, and then I want us to have a conversation. How many of you have ever flown to Israel on El Al? El Al. That's nice to see. On behalf of the Jewish people, I apologize for the rude person who was in front of you on your last flight. Also for the fact that the steward wouldn't accommodate your otherwise reasonable request that you know on British Airways they would have said no problem to. I apologize for all of that. My in-laws, they should rest in peace, were both Israelis. And before she died, my mother-in-law made me promise her that I would only fly to Israel on El Al. I believe I am the only conservative rabbi who only flies to Israel on El Al because everyone tells me about how great the flight is on this other airline or that other airline. And I know my mother-in-law well enough to know that she would come back and haunt me if I were to even try to fly to Israel on United or British Airways or any other civilized airline. <laughs> So in the old days, when you flew to Israel on El Al, you may remember this, when you got to the point in the flight where you were about to see Eretz Yisrael, they would get on the loudspeaker system and they would say, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to see the land of Israel. And then they would start playing, playing Hevenu Shalom Alechem, the schmaltziest version they could find. Mm -hmm. And we would all cry because there's something to it, isn't there? The first time you see that sliver of land and you realize you are seeing what your grandparents could only dream about. And it's real and you can go there, we can go there. And now, because El Al is trying to look like a real airline, and they, like Israeli hotels, they come very close to looking almost like the real thing. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. So you know what I do? I say it out loud to myself and to my row, and then I start singing. And the people around me, they join in. Because that land is home, not in the where do you live sense, but where are you from sense. Years ago, I ordained the chief rabbi of Uganda, a man named Gershom Sizomo, who is the head of the Abba Yudaya community in northeastern Uganda. And he had me go to Uganda to do his installation, which I did. And you should at some point go, it's amazing. Um, and I had a sense in Uganda that as a human being, I was coming home. You know, we're all from East Africa, if you go back far enough. But when I go home as a Jew, that's Jerusalem. And, and that place, that land, that coastline, those mountains, the look of the Jerusalem stones in the late afternoon, early evening, as the sun is starting to set, the smell of the Galil after a rain, being in the Negev when the wadis are flowing and the flowers bloom, or when it's completely dry and you watch the ibexes jumping on the mountains, that land is for me completely intoxicating and absolutely magical. Um, I'll tell you a land story. So in southern Israel, they did an archaeological dig and they found in Qumran some buckets with ancient dates, dried up, date pits, 2,000 years old, Masada 
So a group of botanists at Ben-Gurion University did the work of germinating some of these things, which that's a trick, 2000 years of just sitting there dry, right? That's something. And they got a male tree out of it that they named Methuselah, it's a good name for a tree. And they got four lady trees, one of whom of course is named Tamar, which means date. And they have been producing ancient Judean dates. Fruit that has not been tasted since the Roman Empire. And they don't sell it online, so don't bother trying. I have a friend who was going to a lot, and on his way, he stopped at Kibbutz Keturah, which is where these ancient date trees live. And they sell them in boxes that look, I swear to God, like Tiffany's. You get these little tiny boxes, and there are three dates in them, and it costs what stuff at Tiffany's costs. In the early Roman Empire, these dates were delicacies that the nobility and the rich enjoyed in Spain, in southern France, and in Italy. Judean dates were cat's meow. And he brought us this box, and one Shabbat evening, my nephew was over. My nephew was totally not observant. And for dessert, we had these dates. These dates blend three things I love more in the world than anything else. They blend science and biology. They blend Zionism and they blend ancient history. So you got, you got a winning combination there, but my nephew couldn't stop talking about it. And just in case you haven't had one, they don't taste like the sweet drippy medjool dates you can get at a Persian Iranian store. They're smaller and much more chewy and not quite so sweet. They're really good. But you're tasting history. And that for me is the land. There's not a part of that land that doesn't tell part of our story. There's an act of self-discovery anytime you walk anywhere in the land of Israel as a Jew. And that makes this place precious to me beyond all politics. Two, the people. I joke to you about that Israeli on the El Al flight. My first time getting on an El Al flight, there was a Jewish woman. I used to call her a little old lady, but I'm approaching her in age, and I can see eventually I'm starting to settle in height too. So I'm going to lay off of that. But she was about yay high, which I think she was kind of concentrate. Like if you added water, she would have been six feet but it was all packed in this little tiny Jewish body, which had climbed up on a chair and was taking the beglach that were there for breakfast and throwing them on the floor because she wanted to put her luggage above her seat and that's where the beglach were. And the stewardess, young Zionist that she was, was yelling at this woman at the top of her lungs. And this woman was not bothering to answer. And she won. <laughs> and I love that. I love places where little Jewish ladies get to win fights. And it wasn't because the stewardess was being graceful or gracious. It's because she would had taken her down. And I love that. I love that there's a place where we get to be ourselves. We get to be as brash as we want to be and as pushy and as loud. And for all the ways Israelis will yell at you and fight with you, the minute you show a human connection, they'll drop everything to do whatever you need. And I saw that with Alana's family. One of my closest friends, Judith Edelman Green, is an American from more or less this part of the world. Um, who made Aliyah about 40 years ago and has spent her life working with special needs children. She created Israel's first national bar bat mitzvah program for the Masorti movement. 
special needs kids of all denominations or none come to that program because the Orthodox synagogues won't let them have an Aliyah and the secular don't have anywhere to go for an Aliyah. So they go to her program. And, and Israel is Judith for me. My college roommate, Jeremy Benstein, from a family from Toledo, Ohio, and he made Aliyah right after, you know, Jeremy? Somebody knows Jeremy. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I don't remember you sneaking out in the morning, but, but I don't judge. So, uh, Judith's husband was my roommate. <laughs> so everybody has lived with someone connected to the Benstein's. Fine. Jeremy, for the two of you who don't know him, <laughs> lives in the north, right outside of Haifa. And he does incredible work on environmental issues and issues involving local Arab and Jewish cooperation. After the attack in October, he participated in a meeting of 800 Jews and Arabs coming together to be with each other after the attack in Haifa, in Haifa. Israel for me is Judith and Jeremy and Ilana's brother, Danny, who lives with his family in Ganyavna, right? And just as for you, America isn't everything every American says. You have your list of Americans you can't stand and American politicians who you think should be shot in a rocket ship far, far away. We all do that. But we also have our America, the politicians we really admire, the people whose values we care about, the organizations that support our values. This is my Israel too. I have my Israelis and my organizations, and they stand for really beautiful and powerful things that I don't see elsewhere in the world. And the thought that all of us can be connected to this place of origin feels really important to me. There was a great um, Schultz in, in Peanuts years ago did a cartoon in which Lucy accused her brother Linus of hating humanity. And he said, I love humanity. It's just people I can't stand. Right? Well, I have enough Israelis that I feel connected whenever I hear that accent, whenever I see that way of moving in the world that Israelis embody. And so part of what connects me to Israel is Israelis. There are five cities in the world that have 85% of the world's Jews. Here comes the exercise. You want to guess? New York. Nope. Jerusalem. Tel Aviv. Haifa. One more. Los Angeles. Los Angeles, New York, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa. Those five places have 85% of the world's Jews. And I'll give you a more astonishing statistic, there are two countries that have 90% of the world's Jews, and that is the United States and Israel. So you can't love Jews if you don't have a strong relationship with Israel. When we interview people for rabbinical school, we have long conversations about that. I don't care what your politics are, but if you don't love Israel, you're not loving 53% of the Jewish people in the world. And there's no way to be a rabbi if that's you. So I love Israel for the land. I love Israel for the people. When I was a kid, the symbols of Jewish identity were bagels and lox and cream cheese and Brooklyn. 
Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Cream cheese, lox, bagels, and Brooklyn. Well, the Dodgers still are a very powerful symbol of Judaism to some of us. My father came from Brooklyn and tells wonderful stories about Brooklyn and to the end of his days saw that as the homeland. Um, I did point out to him when he got nostalgic about it that he's the one who left. <laughs> You know, and so it may be that Brooklyn becomes more lovable when you're 3,000 miles away. I don't know. But there was an old joke that my dad used to love to tell, which was when all the Jews from Brooklyn moved to California, they raised the IQ in both places. <laughs> now, if you go into a Judaica shop, it's all palm trees and pomegranates. There are no more bagels and locks because the symbols of Judaism are now Zion. And that's been a transformation within our lifetimes. And that is then to lead me to the third thing, which is the culture of Israel. And I want to say something deep, and then I want to say something superficial. Years ago, I was at the Israel Museum. I assume many of you have been to the Israel Museum big museum in Jerusalem. Okay, so I'm there, and you know, museums tend to have a certain common thing about them. You know, there are big paintings of dead people, often dead, fat European people, and there's broken pottery, and there are ancient mirrors that don't work anymore, and there are earrings that have been buried in a cave for hundreds of years. You know, it's kind of like looking through my drawers. But in the main hall, they had a transparent booth, and inside it was a silver amulet, about two inches tall, of beaten silver, so thin as paper. And on it, scratched in the ancient Hebrew letters, was Birkat Kohanim, the priestly benediction. It is to this day the oldest fragment of Bible ever uncovered. And some Jew in the time of King Hezekiah, his Kiahu, around 800 BCE, had that scratched onto silver and then wrapped up and worn as an amulet around his neck. And I started to cry in the museum because that blessing I say to my children every Friday night. Many of you have that same custom. And I thought, where in the world is there a people who have a continuous cultural link to their very origins? We pray to the same old God in the same old language, using the same old books, celebrating the same calendar, and the prayers that they said in the time of King Hezekiah my children, no, my son Jacob created an offshoot of the tradition. Normally, the parents put their hands on the child's head. Jacob, years ago, put his hands on mine. So we do a mutual sharing of blessing every Friday night with those ancient words. And the museum sells a copy of it. So I have a replica. I'm telling you that because the last shul I showed this at, someone said, how did they let you take it out of the country? <laughs> they were not as sharp as you are, but I'm just putting it out like that so that no one embarrasses themselves. Not the original, but I wear that as a sense of cultural continuity. Nobody can tell me that land isn't ours. 800 BCE, same prayer, same language, same God, and we've carried it with us everywhere we've gone. But there's also something remarkable, not just is the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, a map of the land of Israel, the Mishnah, which is the first and foundational rabbinic work. I read two Mishnahs every day. And 
And, and every time I open the Mishnah, I'm walking the hills of the Galilee with Rebbe Meir and Rebbe Yehuda and Rebbe Yochanan. And, and there are Midrashim and there are Piyutim that are in our prayer books and in our Machsor that were written in that land, but also the rebirth of the Hebrew language. Can you think of another ancient language that was just a scholarly language and then became again the spoken language of a people? Latin doesn't do that, right? Ancient Greek is different than modern Greek, right? But Israeli school children read the words of the prophet Isaiah and it's their language. That's unprecedented in the world. The culture of Israel, Israeli poets and fiction writers and artists are, are celebrated internationally for the quality of the work that they do and the way they're able to see humanity in Israeli lives. And that fills me with great pride. You can walk into a Barnes and Noble if you can still find one. And if you go into their fiction section, you'll find Israeli writers, which is amazing. So the culture of Israel is the third thing that binds me to that place. And then the fourth, and this one is political. The reason Zionism succeeded is not because the Jewish people chose Zionism. It's because nowhere else would take them in. In 1920, the United States started to close its borders. That's when Zionist Aliyah went up. Jews in 1920 would have much rather come to the United States if given the choice, but they weren't given the choice. And then during World War II, they weren't given the choice to flee to France, to England, to the United States, to Cuba. They were turned away everywhere and often sent back to their death. We have to have a country where we can go. We have to have a place where we are in control and where we can make the same stupid mistakes that every other nation gets to make without people calling into question the existence of the country. You want to say that we are just as dumb as the English in running a country? Fine, I'm good with that. But, but we need a place, as our president said publicly, there has to be a Jewish country for Jews anywhere to be safe. And so that is my one political link to Zionism. The rest are culture and language and people and land. But, but there's a physical reality that until recently was masked in the United States, although it's becoming more overt here too. There are just a lot of people who want us dead and who would be very happy to have us all go away. And then they would be very sad after we die, and they would create a memorial day on our behalf. They just resent us when we're alive and have power. Well, I think I speak for all of us when I say that if I have to choose between their good wishes and my breathing, mm -hmm. I'll take life. Thank you very much. Think of me what you want. Last story. I grew up not observant. And in college was the first time I encountered traditional Jewish observance. And I had a friend who asked me if I would help him make a minion. And I'm pretty handy. So I figured I could help him make whatever he wanted. I didn't know what, what one looked like, but he could describe it to me and I could figure it out. So he took me to a room in which the guys were all on one side of the room and the women were all on the other side of the room and the men were wrapped in leather. And I'm from San Francisco, so I'm pretty used to that. Although the context is different. 
I was very excited about that. And I helped him to make a minion for the rest of the semester. Um, and then when I got home, I went to my grandmother and I told my grandmother about it. And I told her about these amazing leather boxes that I had never seen or heard of in my life. And she went into her closet. And I will tell you now, um, those of you who are grandmothers, you should know that your closets become magic. The things that grandmothers put in their closets are just amazingly fascinating, endlessly fascinating. Um, and they pull all kinds of things out of their closets that no normal person has. So my grandmother went into her closet and she rummaged and she brought out a box. And in this brown paper bag were the tefillin of her father, which had not been used in four generations. Those are the tefillin I use. Tomorrow I will put on my great grandfather's tefillin. But the first time I went to Israel as the dean of a rabbinical school, and I was staying in a hotel, the back wall of which faces the old city, and I had a mirpeset, a balcony, and I got out on the balcony to do shacharit, the morning prayers, and I put on my great-grandfather's tefillin facing the old city. And it occurred to me that there was nothing about what I was doing that wouldn't have felt messianic to him. Meaning, the Messiah has to have arrived for this to have happened. His great-grandson is a rabbi. In my family, that's pretty rare. In fact, if you do a past life regression in my family, you have a straight line all the way back to the primordial sludge without a single rabbi all the way back. So his great grandson, a rabbi, coming to Jerusalem, which is now a free Jewish city, using his tefillin as part of his daily prayer ritual, to visit the young Americans who he's going to help become rabbis in a free Israel. Nothing, nothing, nothing about that scene would have been part of his rational waking life. In his wildest dreams, that would exceed it. And I tell you that to remind you we are living the dream. However bad it may seem to you right now, we are living the dreams that our ancestors only fantasized about. A free Jewish democracy supported by the world's most powerful democracy in which Hebrew has been reborn. The ancient dates are growing again for the first time in 2000 years. So let me tell you my last, what I love about Israel story. You may have noticed that in the Torah, when it speaks about tzitzit, the knotted fringes of your talit, it says that one of them should be a thread of blue, techelet. For the last 2,000 years, Jews have only had white tzitzit because techelet is made from a sea mollusk, the murex trunculus and it's taken from a gland in the back of the snail's neck. When ancient Israel was a commonwealth from the time of the Maccabees through into the Roman period, there was a lively industry of techelet making. Because if you take the dye and you let it stop before it gets to blue, it becomes the purple that was so expensive that only royalty could wear it. The phrase putting on the purple comes from Tehelet. And in the Roman Senate, the emperor could wear an all purple toga. The senators got to have a strand of purple on their togas and others could just have a string. Putting Techelet in our tzitzit is a way of saying every Jew is nobility. We are all God's children, and we are God's people. And that mark of royalty distinguished us when we were in the land. 
But in one of life's great wonders, when the Jewish people were exiled from the land, Tehillit disappeared. The industry stopped. And now that we're back, it's back. They are harvesting those snails again, and they are making Tehillit tzitzit again because we are part of that land and the land breathes Jews. It changes its agricultural produce when we are there. It changes the bounty of the sea when we are there. It turns out when the rabbis and when Jeremiah spoke about Zion weeping for her children, that wasn't just a metaphor. We are her children and we can go home now whenever we want. So I wanted to share that with you because it's so easy to get caught up in the terrible headlines, and they are, and to feel a sense of doom, and that's not illegitimate. But I want to remind you that we are bound to that land by deep and unbreakable cords, and that nothing and no one can take that away from us. Shalom. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. So when I hear you speak, I really basically hear you say the Jewish people are what pulled us back to Israel. So you talked about the gates. It was Jews who found the gates, people who found the gates. It was all the way through your story. You talked about the people made it happen. I can imagine that in Greece, if the Greek people wanted to go back to that original language, they could do that. But the Jews decided they wanted to do it. They wanted to bring the whole history back with them to the present day. And that's, I think, what makes the Jewish people unique. Well, that's, you'll have to bring me back for that talk because I, I, I have a talk. I have a talk on the concept of chosenness, not as theology, but as fact. And, and I believe I can muster the evidence to show you that, that Jews' chosenness is a historical fact, not a religious assertion. So I don't think it's distinguishable. But if I'll remind you, the first thing I talked about was the smells of the Galilee and the sun setting in Jerusalem. And as much as I'd like us to take credit for that, I think someone else gets the credit for that. That too. Yes, and then you. <laughs> no. Whole new area of exploration tomorrow. I have lots. The older it's were about this, but I have a little more understanding. Well, you'll have to have me back sometime. Uh, Rabbi, I just I had promised him next. So, oh, yeah, let's just end on the one. No, I mean, I, I think I feel the same way. The same way on there. Um, I think the problem is, you know, we talk about the partition of India and the Muslim language of Pakistan, mostly Hindus having to move to India. And it was sort of happened in the partition of Israel where all the Jews from the Arab world came to Israel. But many of the Muslims and Christians, you know, they also feel a connection with people. Yeah. And, and that's that's the real hard part. Is how do you, you know, as much as I would love the Gazans to walk across the border and go to Egypt with their Arab neighbors, they have connections to the land that Great. is very hard to deny. So I don't want to deny it. I I think the beauty of Israel is as Chaim Weizmann used to say, we have the capacity to create a Middle Eastern paradise there. If we can find a way to incentivize our Palestinian cousins that they have something to lose, which we have not given them the chance to experience yet. But if we could find ways to 
occupy with fairness and with democratic values, not today and not tomorrow, but somewhere what I want is for us to get to a point where people would choose to live rather than to die at the possibility of expelling the other. And so I think from our side, we have to ask ourselves hard questions about what does occupying smart look like and how do we occupy in such a way that the Palestinians can start to imagine a life with us living closely together. Um, but that's not going to happen right now. That's going to be down the road. But um, every policy choice we make has to be made on two fronts. It has to be made in terms of short-term security and long-term does it preserve the possibility of an eventual peace. That's the only way. I'll just remind you all that the Crusader state in the land of Israel lasted for 200 years, and you only have to lose the last battle to lose the war. And I don't want our great, great, great grandchildren to ever face that day. So we have to be thinking of that day in our policy decisions now. You talk about our Palestinian cousins, and what would you say that about convincing our Jewish cousins that they have to accept their Palestinian cousins? So it's kind of a two-way thing. Well, in fairness to me, I just told my Jewish cousins that they have to do that. Um, and I do that everywhere I go. So I'll reveal to you something else. Since October and the disaster, I around my neck, I wear the Birkat Kohanim from Ketev Pinom, and I wear the Svirot, which are the Zohar's symbols of the divine with the colors assigned by Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. Each one of the Svirot has a color. But I've added two new things. I went online and I got a map of Eretz Yisrael with a Jewish star in it, and I got a map of Palestine that says Palestine in Arabic. The amazing thing is they're the same map. The Jews, when they do an outline of Israel, erase the Palestinians. The Palestinians, when they do a map, they erase the Jews. But we both love the same land. So we're going to have to learn that loving the land means somehow making room for all of its children. And that's the task of our generation. And here's what I want to hold out to you. 100 years ago, the typical Christian position about Jews was unmitigated hatred. The gift we gave God in the last 100 years is that Jews and Christians see each other's religion as allies. For the first time in human history, right? American churches have been supporting Israel more than the secular Americans have, right? And there are certainly anti-Israel groups within Christianity, but on the whole, American Christianity has been extraordinarily philo-Semitic. We need to start with our neighbors. We need to start building those connections. And one step at a time, strengthening it so that there can be room for a vision of a shared love of the same land, which I don't think is going to mean one state. I think there has to be a Jewish state that's run by the Jews and a Palestinian state run by the Palestinians eventually. But again, now in advance, we need to start thinking about what are the policy choices to make today that hold that possibility open for when it becomes relevant. That's a pretty stiff order on both sides. Yes, sir. Uh, I flew to Tel Aviv about 20 years ago, and they were unconventional in their approach, but I thought it was an excellent airline. An expert one, but I was impressed. <laughs> so I'm wondering if it, if it may not be a sign of decline, and just as in the United States, you could see a lot of signs of decline in the last 20 years. Israel 
Um, I, I can tell you that when I have flown British Airways to London, I'm treated differently <laughs> than when I fly El Al. And I still choose to fly El Al because I love the fact that the minute you get to the airport, you're in Israel. And I love those extra 16 hours of Hebrew and Israeli cultures and Israeli movies. And I, I'm very happy to fly El Al. That wasn't a criticism. It's just part of the shtick. <laughs> yes. As you're going around the country and getting similar talks, have you come across any programs that are particularly successful at conveying the love for Israel to our younger Jews? Where clearly there's less connection than most of the people say it is. That was my question. Well, I have a couple things to say, some of which will be uncomfortable. First is, I get to work with young Jews. I get to work with a particular slice of young Jews. I get to work with young Jews who are at Jewish summer camps and who might be potential rabbis one day. And I get to work with young Jews who are training to be rabbis. And what I can tell you is the biggest challenge that many of them face is that when you were young, Israel was a scrapping little socialist country in a sea of right-wing monarchies. Our children weren't alive then. They don't remember the little cartoon character in the Temba Kovel, right? They only know Begin and Netanyahu's Israel. And we've raised them with some wonderful values. We've raised them with the idea that everybody deserves an equal shot and all people have dignity and you talk through your problems instead of just bullying and we've taught them a whole lot of things and then they look at israel and they only know israel as a power so i think there are multiple fronts that we have to do one of which is to engage them in conversation Right? Find out why they feel about Israel the way they do and have discussions that are fact-based and not anger-driven. They've listened to your values around the table. They just don't think Israel should be an exception to those values. So that's a hard thing for American Jews to hear. It's actually not a hard thing for Israeli Jews to hear. 500,000 of them are out on the streets protesting. They understand. But in America, that's dicey. We've not done a good job of showing people that there are many different ways to be a Zionist. What does it mean if you love Israel, but you love it from a slightly left of center position? When J Street started, American Jewish institutions acted as though J Street were Jewish voices for Palestine. So we had no outrage left for JVP because we had already used it all up on J Street, which turns out is kind of moderate. So one of the things I say to the Jews I talk to is you had better start creating a community in which there are multiple ways to love Israel and not just one party line. Because the kids who have the hardest time I got a call two weeks ago from parents in Los Angeles. They're Persian Jews. They've raised their kids at a pretty conservative, conservative synagogue. And two of their kids have grown up the way they want them to. And one kid is now JVP and gives classes on, I grew up at a propagandistic synagogue that only told one side of the story. So call me if you need help. And I've said to them, it would kill me to have a kid who thinks that way. I feel your pain, I feel whatever. But you raise that kid with the idea that if you're not a this kind of Jew, don't bother. And he took your option. So we had better create a range of ways to love Israel 
to be able to hold people together. Imagine if you couldn't be a member of the synagogue if you weren't a member of one political party. And not only you have to be a member of that one political party, but you have to vote for the wing of that party that I support. Right? So it's not okay that you're a Democrat. You have to be a Bernie Sanders Democrat or a Joe Biden Democrat. Not enough that you're a Republican, but you got to be a Cheney Republican or you have to be a Trump Republican. Like, we don't do that. We say everybody's welcome here. There are many ways to love America. Stay involved. Let's argue with each other. Let's yell at each other. Let's learn from each other. But with Israel, you're either pro-Israel, which means one narrow slice, or you're something else we don't have a name for. So I think we have pushed a lot of those kids in that direction. And what I've been trying to say around the country is our hearts are bigger than that. One can love and identify with Israel and also be passionate about the rights of Palestinians to dignity and safety. In fact, I think that's a better embodiment of Jewish values. When after the 67 war, Ben Gurion spoke out about the dangers of permanent occupation. David Ben Gurion, right? He said, it will kill our country. If we hold on to that land and we rule those people, it will kill our country. No one listened. No one's listened now. That position would get labeled anti Israel. David Ben Gurion. So I think we need to be talking to our young Jews. We need to take them there. And when they tell you they want to go visit the territories, go with them. There are Jewish groups that will walk you through the territories and will let you meet Palestinians and listen to them. You don't have to agree with them. I'll tell you one of my favorite stories about that. Years ago, we had, like JTS, we have a program in Israel every year. A group of our students went on an encounter trip, which is a group that takes Jews into the West Bank to meet with Palestinians. I got a call in the middle of the night from one of my left-wing students, frantic, because they had had tea in a Palestinian's home. And as she was pouring the tea, she calmly explained that murdering a Jew in Israel is resistance. And the rabbinical student, trying to hold the facade of American liberalism, said, wait, are you saying that if someone put a knife in my back, you would think that was justified? And the woman said, yes, would you like one lump or two? <laughs> Having those open conversations will help reveal that this is very complicated. And that the one thing that's pretty certain about people with knee-jerk, simplistic reactions is they're probably wrong. But that means our knee-jerk, simplistic reactions are also wrong. So we need to be talking to each other. We need to be talking with love and with shared commitment. And we need to explain to people, you know, one of the things I've talked about my kids is I'm, I was a kid during the 67 war. And I remember that week in which we all held our breath because we thought it might well be over. And the incredible feeling of relief when the war ended and Israel had preserved itself. But my kids never experienced that. When they look at the news, all they see is bullying and destruction and terror. We need to be able to open the gates to wider conversations than we've had. Don't write off the next generation. The kids today are amazing, extraordinary people, and they bring a strong critique to the things we took for granted. But sometimes they've got something to say. Not always, sometimes. From your position as a chancellor, are you aware of any formal attempts to change curriculum about this Sure. Look, the, nobody, I'll, yeah, I'll repeat the question. The question is, are there any uh, attempts that I know of within Jewish education to change the way Israel is presented? And the answer is absolutely. So the claim of today's 
30 year old, we were only told one side of the story. That is true. It's not true anymore. At Jewish day schools, it's not true anymore. At Camp Ramah, they teach them and expose them to very different perspectives, including Bedouin and Palestinian and settlers. Um, when they do Israel trips like Honeymoon Israel, they meet with diverse groups. They're given offers of going into the territories, right? Jewish educators are very aware that our kids are heat-seeking missiles for detecting propaganda, and it doesn't work. So if we don't arm them with real conversation, then we're just going to produce what we most fear. So yes, they're not getting the same kind of Hasbara stuff that we got. Uh, I want to just first see if there's people who haven't yet spoken. All right, who is? It is divided and we just bring the Orthodox Jews and separately Jews who are not headed in the wrong direction and will not be able to talk to each other, perhaps in the future. The president of Israel speaks of Israel in terms of tribes. And he says there are multiple tribes. So there's the Hiloni Israelis, and there's the national religious Israelis, they tend to be Ashkenazi. And there's the Haredi and Hasidic Israelis, and there's Mizrahi communities. And these communities don't really mingle much. Like they mingle during the day, but not on weekends and at night. Um, so I don't think it's an Orthodox, non-Orthodox divide. I think it's that there are mutual incompatible ways of being Israeli and they all think they're right, and they don't see the need to talk to each other or accommodate each other. And the way the Israeli governmental system works, it encourages that. Because if you have to put a coalition together, you become beholden to whoever will be part of your coalition. We're seeing that in the current coalition. So I think it's actually a bigger problem than you're saying. Were it only a problem of Orthodox and non-Orthodox, that would be progress. But it's a problem of five different Israeli tribes, each of whom thinks the others should go away. Yeah, just to clarify part of the answer, in every election in Israel, there's anywhere from 20 to 35 parties standing for election to the Knesset. It's more than five parties, right? It's, it's oh. 30, 35 different Yeah, 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 sure. Parties. Right. And the challenge is, you know, if you look at the total votes, the left and center do pretty well. They just don't do well enough to make a coalition. Right. Because the way Israeli politics is set up, there's a limit to how far left you can go, but there is apparently no limit to how far right. So there are a whole bunch of left wing votes that just don't count. You might as well stay home. Right. But you can vote as far right as you want. And these days, they'll take you in the coalition. So Israel has an enormous electoral challenge, right? Yeah. I, I'm gonna repeat that, I guess, as a counterpoint, I think it's important to say in this moment, there's enormous uh, solidarity. Yes. Oh. And I think it's very important for us to, to promote that uh, reality as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> And that is even across the spectrum, any spectrum, any dimension you want to left. Yeah. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, there is a, a a a stepping up among all Israelis for each other. Yep. Wherever. Yes. However, Great. And I think I think that's another side of the you know, that we have to remember and hold to it from up. Very Sorry. important. So thank you for saying that out loud. And I want to. I want to no. I want to augment that. Um, there has been an upswing in Haredi Jews signing up to serve in the IDF in ways that are unprecedented, and I do think there is wall-to-wall -wall support for getting the hostages back and for making sure that Hamas can't repeat that kind of a step. And frankly, I've seen that in the United States as well. You know, for all of our hand wringing, my favorite statistic these days is that it's very hard to buy a Magen David. 
because they have flown off the shelves, right? Jews who didn't want to publicly identify are wearing Jewish jewelry out on the street to assert that we are here. So both in Israel and in America, and by the way, the polls, if you look at American Jewish support for Israel, for all of our hand-wringing about the young, the wall-to-wall, 90% of American Jews, including the young Jews, say that they support Israel. So that does need to be acknowledged, um, and we need to build on that. We need to find ways to increase our solidarity with each other without silencing the things we disagree about, but using our solidarity to create spaces to have conversations where we learn from each other. But thank you, that's a very important point. So stay right there, don't go anywhere. Um, I know that many in this room, um, I, I guess I have little kids, but many of you have already raised kids and some of them are taking care of grandkids. And it was very important for me for those who are not here today, who are raising the next generation to get to spend some time with Rabbi Artson. I've, I've been going in community with you for the last two days and I haven't seen as many of them. So tomorrow morning, I'm so glad, often our, our Rosenberg scholars are not able to stay on Sunday. Rabbi Artson's taking a fairly late flight so he can be with us in the morning. So if you wish to come, uh, there's coffee from, from 10 to 10.30. It's gonna be with uh, my and Aviva's uh, sixth and seventh grade class. I want him to be, and, and also Mira's eighth and up class, just to spend a little bit of time, a little Q and A, we'll find something, uh, a, a little nugget to share. And then at 10.30 to uh, 11.30 upstairs, just talking about why be Jewish. And I'm hoping the parents of those in our religious school and at HDS will join us. And so you're also invited to that. But since I realize that many of us have been traveling with Rabbi Artson through the Shabbat, from Erev Shabbat now into Motzei Shabbat, we'll not see him again. Let's give him a round of applause and thank you for joining us. We might need to linger for a moment or two before we walk back to the end. And it's, I know you're saying, let's do a la la, but as dark as it seems, we're we're still a few minutes away. So I'll let you make your own la la at home so we don't uh, end Shabbat future. Okay? So I'll still play Shabbat Shalom for the last 12 minutes. So barely or big word. If we could also sign the I <laughs> 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 